Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift and privilege that we can even today reflect on what your son did and what he spoke to us. So we pray that you would help us to understand this message, that you would fill our hearts with joy and hope that comes from understanding what you have done for us and what you have prepared for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A fellow pastor, a friend of mine, shared with me this, this revealing story as he was visiting one of his members in a hospital. He was introduced to this member's roommate, a Hindu guy, a practitioner of Hindu faith, who obviously was a devout, very devout follower of his religion. And he was a curious and friendly type, so he wanted to learn what the main teachings of Christianity were. What an opportunity, we may think. Let's go for it. So my friend gladly delivered to him the message which we have received from our triune God. So he told him that we believe that all human creatures are spiritually dead in their sins and cannot save themselves from that condition. That because of our sin, we are separated from God and there's nothing that we can do to fix it. Worse, that we don't even realize how bad our situation really is. And in truth, we don't even care much about it. But then the triune God, whom we know as Father and Son and Holy Spirit, He has acted in His grace. He has come to us. He has done everything that's needed so that we again can be reunited with Him already here in this age and then to live with Him in the age to come when the world will be purged of all the evil and when entire creation will be restored in its goodness and, and when God's chosen people will reign for him forever. Ta-da! So he delivered his message. And when my friend had finished this brief summary, what do you think? What happened? What did the Hindu guy say? What hinders me to be baptized? No, not at all. We wish he did. <laughs> this is what he said. To say that I cannot do anything for my salvation, this is the most offensive message that I have ever heard. The most offensive message that I have ever heard. So are you surprised? If so, then this is because we have been insiders, so to speak, to Christian way for too long. We cannot imagine how strange our message sounds to those in the outside. You see, our God, he has, he has designed and created us to live a certain kind of lives. And that's, we w that's why we have built into us this function which constantly evaluates us whether we live up to who we are created to be or not. Put it in a different words, all people, all people live with this question, are we good enough? Am I good enough? We want to be good. We want to be acknowledged that we are good. We need to be good in our own eyes and in eyes of others and no one can escape from this need and of course because we do not know our maker and he's designed for our lives we don't know what exactly makes us good but the need to feel that way it just remains and then we need to find a way how to satisfy that need some people choose religion 
Some people choose different other pathways, like social, social justice movements. Those who choose different religions, like that Hindu guy, they believe that to be good or to be judged to be good by your deity can be achieved if you do certain things and avoid from doing others as instructed by your religion. Makes sense, right? And that's a common theme for all religions, for all of them. You do what you believe, your deity considers to be the right thing, the good thing, and if you succeed, then eventually you will get whatever it is that people in that religion value the most. But see, the same is also true for those who re reject religion as such. And you may have heard it from, from your friends or from relatives or saying that one does not need to be a Christian to do good. Or that one does not need to go to the church to be a good person. See? Even if they do not believe that some deity will hold them responsible for how they have lived, they still have the same function built into them. They still want to be good. They still need to be good. They still want to know that they are good. They still want to feel that they've done the right things and, and lived good lives. And you see, <laughs> this helps to understand why, why some can be so religiously passionate about different social justice issues and so on. For that is their way of being good. They really need it. And unfortunately, many believe that Christianity is just one more alternative to satisfy this need, to feel that we are good people. And if that was all, then pff, who would need it? So we can be good, we can be good without some strangely dressed dude t telling us what to do, right? And this is where this most offensive message hits the road. This is the message that no one wants to hear unless the Holy Spirit has already raised them from their spiritual death. The message that you cannot be good on your own. And sure, everyone can believe what, whatever they want. They can believe they are good enough in their own eyes or in the eyes of those their views they value. But here comes this harsh judgment from the judge of all nations, from God Almighty, who says no one is good, not even one. Worse, he says, you are dead in your sins. On your own, you are dead in your sins. Just think about it. Who among self-identified good people would like to hear that message? This shocking judgment is its like a dark background against which God's glorious grace, his unmerited love and affection, his undeserved kindness shines when he comes to us, to us unworthy, unworthy of his attention, not because we deserve it, not because we are reasonably good or good enough, but only because of what kind of God he is, God gracious and God merciful. And this incredible grace of God was the reason the Pharisees and the scribes, they were complaining about Jesus. This fellow, see, they didn't even use his name. This fellow, that Jesus guy, he welcomes sinners and eats with them. And their shock, in a way, makes sense. Because they were the good guys. They truly were. They tried to keep the laws of God as they understood them. 
They tried to be good with their whole heart. They were passionate about the doing the right things, as are so many today. They deserve to have been appreciated. They had merited it. But what is this Jesus doing? He welcomes tax collectors and sinners, the lowest, the worst, the most corrupt and promiscuous members of their community, that ugly and immoral bunch. And he eats with them, meaning he accepts them. Them, not us. Of course, that was offensive. For they just couldn't accept the message that offended that Hindu guy. That it's only by God's grace that we could be welcomed in relationships with the Chayun God. And not by our feeble attempts to, to be good. But they felt they deserved more. So Jesus tell them these two parables, three actually, about the lost sheep and, and about the lost coin and later about the lost son, or two sons. Who are we in these parables? It would be nice to think about us as courageous and caring shepherds. That's not us. That's not us. We are the lost sheep. We are the lost coin. And you know, you know that sheep are famous for being very smart? <laughs> of course not. Jesus makes this clear that on our own we cannot make it back. According to those who know this stuff, when sheep gets lost, she panics. And she quickly loses her strength. And soon she can only lay on the ground and hope that someone will come and find her before she dies or before she falls prey to some predators. And the message is even more obvious with the lost coin. Can it find its way back? <laughs> no way. Both the lost sheep and the lost coin, they need to be found. We need to be found. And this is where the undeserved grace of our Good Shepherd shines into our lives so unexpectedly as He comes searching for us, going to great length to find us, each one of us. And when He has found us, He puts us on His strong shoulders and He gently carries us home. And so often we still resist. We still keep fighting against him, keep pushing him away, still arguing that we are fine, we are good. <laughs> we can do this on our own. This message is offensive. We cannot save ourselves. We can't do anything about saving ourselves. But unless we first hear and accept this unpleasant truth, then we won't be able to appreciate and rejoice in the flip side of this message, which we know as the good news, the great news, that our prodigal God has chosen to show his unconditional grace to us, that he cares for us, his foolish lost sheep, his little lost coins, more than we know that he values us, that he is faithful to us, and that he will never ever abandon us. That's him speaking to you. I invite you into this fellowship with me. I want you to be with me, to know me as your father and as your brother, and as your God. It's me sending my powerful spirit to dwell in you so that we can be one. 
And I promise I will make you good. I will make you very good. I'll make you holy. Just accept this as my gift. Just say yes. Yes. You see, Christian life is, is lived in tension between these, these two realities. On one hand, learning to recognize what scriptures teach us. That on our own, by our own nature, we are spiritually dead. And on the other hand, that we are loved and cared for beyond our comprehension by the most amazing being. Learning to recognize that, that everything we are, everything we are and everything we have, we have received as a gift from our triune God. It was your God who knit you together and formed you in, in your mother's womb. He breathes the breath of life into your nostrils. He prepared this bountiful planet Earth for you. He gave you your parents. He has cared for you every second, every minute, every day of your life. And even before you were born, he sent his son Jesus for you. He became one of us so that he could make us like him. And he has taken upon himself all the responsibility for every wrong that we have ever done and for all the good <laughs> that we have failed to do. And he has sent his messengers to the furthest corners of the world so that only you would hear his voice, you would hear his message. And you heard it. You heard it. He has called you out of this world into his family, into this divine fellowship. And he still keeps every day you in this fellowship. And remember, none of this is because of our goodness. But because our God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, He has chosen to be good and gracious towards you. We are not here in Christ church because this is our way of trying to be good people. We are here surrounded by God's own family only because the grace of God has shone on us because he has chosen you. And as the Spirit convinces us of this to be true, he renews and transforms us. And then several things happen. <laughs> First, he takes away our arrogance and pride and our self-righteousness. He helps us to become humble, humble and gracious, especially toward those who are, who are not among us yet, because we recognize that we are not here because we are somehow better or more worthy than those outside. We are not here based on our merit, but only because God the Father has been gracious to us. And we also know that he wholeheartedly wants everyone else to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Secondly, when, when the beauty of God's grace sinks in, it makes also our hearts grateful, rejoicing in this undeserved privilege, desiring to do our best to appreciate this gift, to please the giver, and then we do not want to be lazy or indifferent Christians. We get passionate. We gladly strive to live daily lives of repentance. We strive to love our God more than anything else. We strive to joyfully obey Him, responding to everything He has done to us, 
fearing to displease him or somehow to despise his grace. And finally, once we, once we have tasted this grace, once we know that the Lord is good, once we know that our God desires everyone to receive and rejoice in this grace, we too, we too are willing to step out of our comfort zone and to enlist ourselves as messengers of this most offensive message. For we want everyone to hear this news. We want everyone to hear this news. For when this message is proclaimed, when we deliver it to those the Lord has placed in our lives, that is when spirit of life comes and raises them from their spiritual death. It happens just as we speak. That is when the lost are found. That is when the dead are made alive. And then there is, as Jesus said, great joy, great celebration in heaven. I pray today that the Lord would indeed bless us, that he would grant us to witness how many are rich with this most offensive message. I pray that our God could use us to bring many into this wonderful fellowship with him in this fellowship where we can call him our God, our Father, through our brother Jesus, all of us being united with God's own spirit. Because this, this where our gracious God looks at each one of you. He looks at you and he says with fatherly delight, my dear child, you were lost, but now I have found you. I have found you. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Amen.